you, Chris. Welcome, everyone. So we'll start with uh, Nawab Rashtakam, and we also comment. Nawab Rashtakam, and we also comment. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Then A minor. It's okay. So we're going to sing Dhammadar Ashtakam, but after each verse, we're going to sing the English, and the English is going to be there, correct? Correct. Um, after each verse. So we'll sing the Sanskrit call and response, and we'll sing the English all together. And uh, We'll see what happens. <laughs> this is a test. Let's see if like we like this, you know, get absorbed. Sukumari can do it. Okay. D, D minor. I mean, I know it is just I have to look at it. Too high for you? <laughs> That's low for me. Sisi Radha Damadar Ki the Korto Walla Kortal. If you can all just come this way and then do the offerings and make way for the bridge, we can have this and love. Namah Misham Sachi. Ananda Rupam Lasat Kunda Lango Kuleva Jamanam I'm 
Pravanitananda Shadaiti Radha Shivakti Gaur Bhakti Shri Radha Krishna Gopakuna Shrama Kanda Radha Kanda Kiri Govardhani Ki Jai Sri Vrinda Bhantam Ki Jai Sri Maya Purna Prasitam Ki Jai Ganga Maya Ki Jai Jumana Maya Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Shrama Veda Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai Sai Gopamananda All glories to the Assembly All glories to the Assembly all glories to the Assembly of Devotees, all glories to Sri Guru and Guru. Maum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prakshtaya, Vyotalaya, Srinathya, Bhakti Vedanta, Shamini, Tinamani, Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Govardhavani, which is the Sanyavari Pashtamani. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy to see all of you. And I'm honored that my god brothers have come adikarcha prabhu lila ananda prabhu and kalakanta prabhu thank you for making this event most auspicious and i'm so happy that the mother and sister of nandarani has come and the mother and father of riti has come let's give them a big hari boom What? Oh, really, sister? Yes. Oh, there. Sorry. Sorry. I save the best for last. So the schedule for today is that because today is the appearance of Radha Kunda and Bahulastami, my wife is going to speak a little bit about that, and then. Today, it is recommended by our acharyas that this is the most auspicious day to bathe in Radha Kund. And amazing things happen to your bhakti creeper if you bathe in Radha Kund. And somehow or other, by the divine arrangement of Krishna, you're all going to get to bathe in Radha Kund today because Govinda has enough Radha Kund water, Radha Kunda water to drop a little bit on everyone's head. So we're supposed to bathe at midnight, but somewhere in the world it's midnight. <laughs> so anyway, the Shastras say that um, this is the auspicious day to bathe in Radha Kund. So in Vrindavan at midnight, which is now past, that that's when they did all their bath. But, um, and, and then after Janaba speaks, then we will speak about initiation and then we will have uh, the devotees take their vows and we'll have the expressed yajna. Shruti Sagar um, is expert in expressed yajnas. But actually, Prabhupada did expressed yajnas. Nothing too elaborate. So I think that's good. So once again, thank you all for coming. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I was wearing it, but it's a bit heavy. <laughs> I, I did have it. That's beautiful. Thank you, but too much weight. Om Ajnana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha. So, as Mahatma Prabhu was mentioning, today is a very auspicious day. Um, it's Bahulastami and the appearance day of Radha Kund. So I'll just take a few moments and tell you a little bit about each day. So let's start with Bahulastami. So I have to take you to Vrindavan. So raise your hand if you've been to Vrindavan. Okay, so in, in your heart, you can go back to Vrindavan and you can go to... Radhakund, if you've been to Radhakund, or you can just go to a forest there. So one day there was a cow named Bahula, and she was grazing very peacefully, minding her own business. And this was in a forest because this was thousands of years ago. So there weren't buildings and cities and shops and rickshaws like there are now. There were just lots of grazing fields for and pastures for the cows and forests. So 
Bahula was minding her own business and grazing peacefully, and a tiger came and attacked her. And Bahula said, wait, wait, wait. You can eat me, but can I just go back to my home because I just had a calf. I just gave birth to a calf. It's only a few days old, and I just need to feed it. And if you just let me go and feed my calf, I'll come right back and you can eat me. And so a lot of coaxing and convincing later, the tiger finally agreed. So Bahula went home and she fed her calf and she told the calf, this is what's happening. And the calf said, well, let me go instead of you. I'm only a few days old. Whether I'm alive or dead doesn't really matter because I'm just so new here. And Bahula said, no, 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 not possible. Then she went to say goodbye to her master, who was a very kind, munificent Brahmin. And she told him what happened. And he said, oh, well, let me go. I'm an old man. You just had a little baby. So you stay and I'll go. She said, no, no, this is my, my fate. Anyway, somehow they all decided to go together. Bahula and the baby calf and the Brahmin. And when the tiger saw all three of them, he thought, oh, how wonderful. What a great twist of fate. Now I have three meals instead of just one. So while he was deciding which of his victims to start with, his appetizer, Krishna appeared and he was holding his Sudarshan Chakra. And he said to the tiger, if you release this cow, your fame and glory will be forever in this land. So the tiger thought about it and he agreed. So the baby calf was overjoyed and the Brahmin was overjoyed and Bahula, Bahula was overjoyed. And because Bahula demonstrated so much truthfulness and honesty and integrity in her word to the tiger and in her exchanges with the calf and the Brahmin, Krishna named this forest after her and he called it Bahulavan. And that forest is actually located in the vicinity of Radhakund. So many um, Rasika Bhaktas will say that that is the most wonderful forest of all the 12 forests of Vrindavan. Now there's a kund, it's called Krishna kund in Vrindavan, and I'm not sure where it is because there, there's more than one Krishna kund, but there's this particular kund called Krishna kund, and there are the deities of Bahula, her calf, the Brahmin, and Krishna, and that is to remind pilgrims when they come there of this beautiful pastime and how Krishna is always there for his devotees to protect them and save them in their greatest hour of need. So that's a little bit about Bahulasmi. So that happened on this day, let's say more or less 5,000 years ago. And as I said, that forest is located in Radha Kun. So that's a nice segue into it being the appearance of Shri Radha Kunt. So we are now still in Vrindavan and the cowherd boys and the cowherd girls and all the villagers of Vrindavan are just enjoying in their sporting way. And as we know, as most of you know, Krishna sent many, excuse me, Kamsa sent many awful, ferocious demons to try and kill Krishna because he was so afraid that Krishna would come and kill him. And one of the last demons he sent was Aristosora. Now, Aristosora was very big and powerful, and he took the form of an awful looking, scary bull. So he, he came into Vrindavan, and we came in, the earth shook as if there was an earthquake. And so when the cowherd boys and the cowherd girls saw 
this big, huge bull and they felt the earth shaking. They were so scared. And what did they do? They ran to Krishna, of course. And they told Krishna what was happening. And Krishna said, don't worry, don't worry. I've got this. I'll take care of this. So Krishna went and saw the bull and he took his chatter off his shoulders and he wrapped it around his waist to prepare for a fight. So that's basically what ensued. Krishna would take the bull and swing him around and like throw him. And then the bull would go unconscious for a while. And then because he was so strong and powerful, he would uh, wake up from his unconsciousness and then get up and then go and um, try and attack Krishna. And they had this whole attack counterattack thing going on. At one point, Aristosaurus threw a mountain at Krishna. Krishna caught the mountain, threw it back to him. And, and then when he threw him back, oh, then one time he threw Aristosaurus so far, it was 16 miles away from where they were. And then he had to come to and figure out how to get back. There was going on and on. The thing is, Krishna enjoyed this, right? Because boys, even in this world, a lot of boys, they like to wrestle. They like to pray. They like to do rough house and rough it up, see? <laughs> so Krishna's just enjoying this so much. But finally, he realized, I have to, I've got to, I've got to wind this up. I've got to wrap this up. So finally, he just you know, took a Rissasura and just literally smashed him onto the ground. And there's a beautiful uh, analogy that Krishna smashed a Rissasura on the ground, just like a child would take a gourd. So does everybody know what a gourd is? If you take like a squash or a pumpkin and you dry it and you empty it, they're light as a feather, right? They're just you could just squeeze them and like they would crack. So it's like a child would take a gourd and just put it on the ground and, and step on it. It was that easy for Krishna when he finally decided to put an end. So um, after this happened, Krishna thought, okay, we're good to go now. I wanna go back and enjoy Rasa with my friends. So he went to Radharani, kind of proud of himself and thought they could just get back into their Leela. And then Radha said, don't touch me. Krishna said, what do you mean? Radharani said, um, you're contaminated. You just killed a bull, which is the male form of a cow and cows are sacred. So you're, do not come near me. Don't touch me. And Krishna was like, what, what do you want me to do? What should I do? So Radharani said, well, you have to bathe in all the holy places. And Krishna said, okay. So he invoked, I just have it written down here because it's such an enormous amount. Of course, I don't have my glasses, so I can't really see anything. Um, okay, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thanks. He has better eyesight than I do. He, he invoked 62,000 holy rivers from all over the universe. Because Radharani said, you need to bathe in the holy rivers of the universe. She didn't just say of Bharat Varsh, she said the universe. So 62,000 holy rivers from the universe came and they all came in their personified form, right? So as, as goddesses and um, they offered beautiful prayers to Krishna. And then they asked, how can we serve you? And, oh, I forgot one thing. Krishna said, okay, fine. I will, I can't go to all the 62,000 rivers, but I'll, I'll invite them all here and I'll make a, like a hole, like a well for them to come. So he dug his heel in the ground and then they came and then they all went into that hole and it expanded and it became a river or a kund or a lake. And all the rivers there became like their liquid form. And then Krishna took his bath. Very satisfied. He came out. He was so clean and purified. And, and then he said to Rani, Radharani, now what are you going to do? And she said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're contaminated. What do you mean I'm contaminated? You sided with a demon. 
And so she thought, oh, okay. Um, so what do I need to do? And he said, well, you need to bathe also and cleanse yourself. So she thought, all right, give me a minute. So she conversed with her girlfriends and they came up with a plan. They thought, well, we want to make something as wonderful as Krishna's kund. We want to make something beautiful like that too. So they all took off a bangle from their wrists and they dug a big kund. Somehow they did it, right? It was transcendental magic. But the thing is, it was dry. There was no water in it. So now what? So now keep in mind, there's thousands of gopis here. So they decided that they would make this long line and they would take pots from one of the holy rivers nearby called the Manasaganga. And they would like in an assembly line, right? Just pass the pot and pass the pot and then pour the water in like that. So they did this for a while, but the, the holy rivers that were in Krishna's kund were really, really eager to serve Radharani, really. Re like they really wanted to do service for her. So they asked, they begged, can we also enter your kund and she said yes so they also entered it and then lo and behold you have two beautiful kunds shama kund which is also a name for krishna and radha kund now the interesting thing is that when devotees go to vrindavan and they're going to go to radha kund that they go to radha kund nobody goes to shama kund right wow. There's not even a town called Shamakund, it's Radhakund. So Radhakund is really the, the, the crest jewel, the crown jewel, the famous of the famous, right? The most famous. There's famous, more famous, and most famous. So Radhakund is the most famous. And there's this beautiful pastime where Krishna shows how powerful and transcendental. Radha Kund is. So I'm going to tell you that pastime. Now, many of you know that Radha and Krishna would meet and have pastimes together. So one evening, they had a planned pastime to engage in. And Krishna went to where Radha Rani would be in a beautiful forest, a beautiful Kund and a beautiful bower. And he knocked on the, the bower door, I guess you could say. And Radharani was in kind of a, a little bit of a fiery mood, let's say, right? Little chinchilla. She wasn't feeling like, yeah, just come in. She wasn't feeling like she wanted to hang out with Krishna that evening. So she said, go away. And he said, what do you mean go away? She said, I don't know. I'm just not in the mood. You know, she was displaying some transcendental mon, right? Um, so he thought, what do I do now? I came here to be with Radharani and she doesn't want to be with me and she's in this mood and um, she's just sort of manifesting this interesting transcendental feminine divine mood and I don't know what to do. So then he had an idea. He thought, I will go to Radhakund, pray and beg and bathe. So that's what he did. He went there. And he offered prayers, which is what we do when we go. He offered flower garlands, which is what we do when we go. He offered arti, which is what we do when we go. And he took bath and he begged for the mercy, which is what we do when we go. And then by divine arrangement, with the help of some of um, Radha's closest sakis, um, Radharani came to her kund and everything was fine and then they enjoyed their pastimes so that's the power even krishna is showing the power even krishna begged and prayed and worshiped and honored and bathed in radha kund now that was approximately five thousand years ago and at some point in time radha kund and shama kund got sort of lost you could say right overgrown even if you go back to a an abandoned building or house or something it's you have to look for it and there's trees and bushes so you can imagine thousands of years later 
they were gone. And when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came 500 years ago and he went to Vrindavan, he was on a mission to find Radhakund and Shamakund. So he was asking all the local devotees, where is Radhakund? Where is Shamakund? And nobody knew. There were these other little sort of teeny little ponds that had other names, which I can't remember right now. Uh, they said, well, maybe this was Radhakund and Shamakund. So they took him there and he sat there and just moments later, he had all kinds of transcendental ecstatic emotions in his body. And then he just knew right then and right there and all the pastimes started to become manifest to him. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, he manifested physically and emotionally and transcendentally that this is indeed Radhakund and Shamakund. And so since that time, the devotees in our Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition have been going there just like him and doing the things that he did and the Goswamis did and even Sri Krishna did and taking bath and worshiping and honoring. And the thing is, it's it's not just water, it's it's liquid love. And it's Radharani's liquid love. So if some, you know, Rasik say it is the most powerful place in the entire universe. And when we approach Radhakund in a mood of deep humility, and we take bath in that very special pure consciousness, then something transformational can truly happen. And it sort of can accelerate, if you will, um, your spiritual advancement and it can put you in a, it can do something to your bhakti creeper that nothing else can do, soften it and prepare it so that you can just make lots of spiritual advancement in a way that you can never do otherwise because you're getting the mercy of Srimati Radharani in liquid love form. It's pretty powerful. So we're going to get a drop of that. And that's all you need. You don't need a whole, in fact, some people don't even go in. They just pay their obeisances and take a few drops and put it on their head. So that means that everybody in this room, if they choose to, and if they can cultivate the right mood, and everybody can, um, then you have the opportunity tonight to enter into a very deep and special spiritual place and allow it to wash over you, to wash over your consciousness and your mind and your heart and kind of be reborn, if you will. <laughs> and we're going to have some real rebirths tonight too. So it's like a, a, a very extra special double opportunity for the initiates. You get Radha Kun's mercy and you get your Guru's mercy and Prabhupada's mercy. And yeah, I mean, this is a very special day. So you're very fortunate. Yeah, so you can answer that. <laughs> I don't want to hog the show here. Um, just pray for mercy, pray for love, pray for humility sometimes it said you pray for what you need most in the spiritual realm that is not for a new car or you know a new house but pray for what you feel is keeping you impeding you most in developing prema bhakti so whatever it is that you need most that's going to catapult you to the next level that you need to go you can pray for that you want to add to that yeah, so um, you're, praying. you're praying to the one who's most compassionate. And you're praying during Karchi. So that's powerful. I want to say something about Radha, which is, are you finished? Yeah, thank you for that. It's beautiful. 
Shishi Radha Kunda Ki Jai, Bahulastami Ki Jai, Bahulavan Ki Jai, Bahula Ki Jai. They thought that those were the three, there are three names, the Bahula sisters. And I told them, uh, not this, this initiation, no, but those can be their nicknames, the Bahula girls. Maybe. If you like, if you like, if you like. So we just sang the Dhammadar Ashtakam in the eighth verse. Well, seven verses are about Jusoda and Dhammadar. The eighth verse is about Radharani, and Radharani is not part of that pastime. There is another pastime when Radharani, well, actually, she is part of the pastime, but indirectly but there is a pastime where radharani tied up krishna but this this is not describing that pastime have you under, ever wondered why such a ratamuni who wrote this mentions radharani like what is what's her part in the lila would you like to hear it's quite interesting yeah it's quite interesting just to add to the sweetness you have the water yeah so you can just while i'm talking you can go and just make sure there's enough for everybody. You can probably just, yeah, be careful. So you don't, just one little drop. So otherwise the ones in the back may not get it. Oh, okay. All right, no, no problem. We have more. Fantastic. So it's a tradition amongst Vaishnavas that when you do something, you always ask for forgiveness at the end. You know, you cook. If I made any mistake, please forgive me. If you have a guest, if anything was wrong, please forgive me. You give a class, please forgive me if I've made any mistakes or offenses to anyone. This is Vaishnav culture. Go ahead. Okay, so, so the Vratarani verse is Satya Vratya's Muni's, Muni's way of smoothing out any bumps in his prayers. And the example can be given. If somebody cooks and it's not that good, but if they make a nice sweet, then you ever eat and it's not that good and you get up and you're like angry and you want to scream at somebody or like or are you walking down to the store to buy some cottage cheese and bananas or something you're just not satisfied that ever happened to you yeah it doesn't happen here i don't think but it can it can happen right so but if you have a meal it's kind of as I would describe it when people ask, how was the meal and I don't like it, I describe it as interesting <laughs> or very healthy. How was the meal? It was very healthy. Especially like 20, 30 years ago, very healthy meant it tasted awful. <laughs> it's better now, but, but you remember that? Healthy like 30 years ago was really bad. Anyway, so the meal is not so good, but you have this amazing sweet at the end. And it's kind of like, well, the meal wasn't that good, but that. Hare Krishna. You have. Um, I feel like I'm being embraced by Radharani. I have her name on my charter, name here and now just on my head, it's just so nice. So the meal wasn't that good, but you make this amazing sweet. So after you eat the sweet, you're like, I'm satisfied. So in case there was any fault in his prayers, he put Radha at the end because Radha is the sweetest of the sweet. So if he puts Radha in there, then if any mistake, everyone will be satisfied. Ready? I just wanted to add one thing that I was taught um, 
one thing we can pray for is humility. Because when we're humble, when we can really embrace and embody humility, then nothing can really get in our way of making spiritual advancement. We don't commit offenses to other people, to devotees. We don't see ourselves better than anything else. We just flow and navigate our way through the world with a with a, a countenance that's so attractive to Radha and so attractive to Krishna. And because Radharani is so merciful and so soft and so motherly, she can give us whatever we want. And since humility is so precious, that's a really beautiful thing to pray for. And also um, by taking a dip or taking a bath or getting those drops, if you have the, that mood of humility, then I've also been taught that, and I've actually had this experience that you can leave your false ego in Radhakund. Like she'll take it for you. And then you don't have to have it anymore. And then when you don't operate under ego, but you operate under essence, then everything's better and different. And you can get very close to the people and the things that you want to. Wow. So on the count of three, we're going to drop our ego. Are you ready? Are you ready? One, two, three. Jai Sri Radhe. Come. Throw your ego on Radhakund. Radhe Krishna. So today is such an auspicious day. And initiation is always auspicious because it's the day that devotees make a commitment to Guru and Krishna to be more dedicated. And so certainly Krishna recognizes that commitment and Krishna reciprocates with commitment. And sometimes people say, well, if you're already chanting 16 rounds and you're already following the four principles and you have a spiritual master and you're always serving, you're already serving him, why do you need to take initiation? Because the only thing that changes, you get three strands instead of one. Instead of being bhakti or bhakti something, you get a spiritual name. Well, there's two reasons. One, as I said, it's the commitment and it's also the process. It's the tradition that this is a samskar uh, to make an imp a deep impression. And it's a purificatory process. So changing the name is part of it, making the vows and so forth. So, there's a thought that I've been having lately. I've just been in Europe and lots of discussions went on. And the thought is sustainability. Sustainability means that I will continue throughout my life in devotional service. And I live in a way that I can continue gradually, gradually gradually. And, and all of us want to become very Krishna conscious very quickly. But that is in Krishna's hand. And what is our in our hand is being steady. So I see initiation as really a commitment to doing devotional service in a sustainable way so that throughout our lives, we make more and more gradual progress. The other thought I, I have, which is, I, I don't usually talk about this at initiation, but I think it's important. At initiation, we're making vows. And Prabhupada said, when we make these vows, it doesn't mean that the propensity to commit the sins necessary will go away or go away easily or go away immediately. But when we make the vow, we're vowing not to engage with that desire anymore. That's what the vow is about. 
And I think a lot of times devotees don't understand that. They think I'm vowing not to do this, not to do that. That's true. But on a deeper level, you're not vowing to let those desires go. You're vowing not to engage with those desires until they naturally go by your spiritual advancement. And so what happens sometimes is that a devotee will run into a situation where they find maintaining their vows is difficult. And so they'll say it's difficult to control this desire or difficult to control that desire. But we can look at it in a different way. That the problem is not with the desire. The problem is with the lack of commitment to the vow. Because if we commit to the vow, we can control that desire. That desire that we think is uncontrollable, that we give into with the excuse that I can't control it, think of it as this way. It's not the problem of desire, it's the problem of commitment to a vow. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's something I'd like you to meditate on and see if that makes sense to you. Because it will always be difficult. It, in fact, I think it's like one of Murphy's laws. He probably has more than one. When you commit to something, it seems like the next day, that thing becomes more attractive. Now I'm not going to do it. I don't know if you've ever done that. Like For, for Kartik, I'm taking a vow. I tell my wife, I'm taking a vow not to eat sugar. And she's like, you haven't eaten sugar in five years. And she's like, Okay, it's an easy vow to take. And the next day, I'm like, where's the sugar? And throw the sugar out of the house. And have you ever had that experience? Like, it's almost like Krishna's joke, maybe. Oh, okay, you're taking this vow. Okay, well, let's see. So don't, we don't necessarily have to focus on the specific vow, but focus more on the principle of commitment. To my word, I've said this. This is what I'm committed to. I'll just share my own realizations in this regard. That in my life, I think all of us have this experience. And especially the disciples of Prabhupada, uh, we, we did many things, still do, but especially when we were younger, we did many things which are difficult. And the difficulties change when you get older, the body slows down, and so it's some things are just the different kinds of difficulties and some things we should do but we don't feel like doing but we do them why, why do we do them because we promised Prabhupada sometimes there is no other reason if you go down I can give you 108 reasons why I don't want to do this I can give you 108 reasons why it's not even good for me to do this, at least I think like that, or why it's unhealthy in some way. Why do I do it? Because I promised my spiritual master I would do it. So vows are very powerful if we actually make them deeply and take them to heart. And that, that really is one of the most important things about initiation. Otherwise, you're already chanting. You already have a spiritual master. You have Prabhupada. You have the holy name, it can deliver you. You can have so many six year gurus, but now you're committing to chant 16 rounds for all these principles. Another realization I had, it was a conversation I heard, I may have explained this to you before. It was a conversation I heard with a creative writing teacher and this teacher had written many books. This teacher was a little bit like Satsup Maharaj who is always writing. He's a natural writer and he's always writing. If you ever get long emails where someone could have said it in three sentences and it's like six paragraphs, that means they're a writer. They like to write, right? At least whenever I get those emails, I go, did you know you're a writer? And, and most of the time they say, no. I go, well, you know, normal people don't write six paragraphs just to say, I'm coming to see you tomorrow. So, this teacher was asked, how do you get the creativity to write? And he couldn't answer the question because he said, 
I don't know how not to write. It's so much my nature. You know, it's like asking the Beatles, where do you get the inspiration to write a song? There's like, they just like, I don't know, wrote like, who knows, 500, 600, some crazy number of songs. It was just like, they, you know, tell Paul McCartney, don't write any more songs. He doesn't know how to do that. He can't. So then I thought, if we go deep within our vows, and then someone will ask you, how is it that after all these years, you were able to chant 16 rounds every day? You will say, I don't know how not to chant 16. It's not, it's not part of my being that that's a possibility. That's what a vow means. I, you know, I may be tired, lazy, or uh, amongst the four regulative principles. It may be difficult, really difficult. And I may think, I have this crazy body and mind. It's so difficult. But if you make the vow deeply, you will say the same thing. Even though I want to do this, I don't know how to do it. I couldn't possibly do it because I made the vow. That's that's what it means to take a vow. And that's and any of you who've taken vows, you can retake them if you think you need them. In fact, I once heard a radio show and they asked the man, how many times have you been married? He said, 28. So, uh, you know, the host of the show is like, <clears throat> uh, okay, um, do you want to say anything about that? He said, yes. Every year, my wife and I, we take our marriage vows. And I think, on Gaur Praneem, if I were God, this is what I would do. On Gaur Praneem, I would have a Maha Fire Yagya, where every devotee retakes their vows. That'd be nice. But actually, you're supposed to take your vows every day, not once in a lifetime, not once a year. If you make a vow, you're actually meant to take it every day. Like someone who is addicted to a substance. If they go through a program, it's just like today, God, get me through it today. It's just this today. I start on my knees, I end on my knees. I commit to today. And then wake up the next morning, I commit to the next morning. That's what it means to take a vow. One-time vows, they don't work. We have to make them every day. And they have to go so deeply that we come to the point and say, I don't, I just could not, I couldn't figure out how not to do this. So if I miss my rounds one day, it's like immediately the next day I finish. I just, I don't know how not to do that. We want to go that deeply. That's that's what it means to take a vow. And that's really, uh, really why we, we take initiation. And it has been studied that if you make a vow to yourself, there's like a 50% chance you will break it. But if you make a vow to another person, there's like a much less percentage of chance that you will break it. And so, and there's another thing. It's called integrity. When you live in integrity, it means what you say you do, and it's empowering. And when you, what you say you don't do, it's disempowering. And you have to live with that. You have to live with the fact that I committed to something and I didn't do it. It disempowers you. So Prabhupada said, you are your word. If you give your word, you should be that. And if you give your word and you become that, it's empowering. It's, there's Shakti in that. It's like you feel like, yes, I can give my word. I've given my word to Guru and Krishna. I do this. I have the Shakti to give my word, my determination. I can give it and do it. And also, Krishna helps his devotees when they give their word to make it a reality. So Krishna will always help you if that's what you want to do. So if you can take this ceremony this way and sustainably follow this your whole life, then Prabhupada promises in this life you can go back to Godhead. And when Prabhupada initiates devotees, that's what he's thinking. I'm 
by this initiation, I am taking you back to Godhead if you will follow my instructions. So we do that on behalf of Prabhupada. We don't make anything up. We just teach what he teaches. And we don't feel we're delivering you, but we feel Prabhupada is delivering you and we're helping you follow him so that he can deliver you. And when you follow him, he will meet you and take you by the hand and introduce you to Krishna. And that is possible in one lifetime. It's possible in one lifetime. So I personally see initiation as a commitment that, yeah, I will do it in this lifetime. But let's do it. At least let's make the effort. That's what Prabhupada wants. That's what he came for. That's why he wrote all those books, because he wants you to do it in this lifetime. And then the other thing, what time? What time should I stop speaking for the express yagya to start? 7.30? Is that too late? Like right now, right? <laughs> He's going to do an express, express yagya. We'll put double speed for the mantras. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish up in a few minutes. Yeah. So, Prabhupada wanted us to talk about offenses to the holy name at initiation, because at first initiation, because this is called Hari Nam initiation. And offenses to the holy name, just like Jana was saying about humility, when, when we get a drop of humility, that's when offenses subside. We stop offending devotees. We become um, careful and cautious about our connection to the holy name. So really what Prabhupada wanted to emphasize at initiation is that you're taking these vows to chant the holy name, but you actually have to chant the real name. Are you chanting? Or are you just chanting? So there's a difference. Or are you chatting? Or are you just chanting? Or are you sleeping? Or, or are you chanting? We all know what distraction means. So if we, at the time of initiation, can internally make this, like people ask me, what's your vow for Kartik? I always say the same thing to hear the holy name. Like everyone's like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to eat donuts, you know, for the first three days of Karti. Then I, then I won't eat chocolate for the next two days. And then no caramel for the next two days. It's like, okay. Or someone says, you know, I won't wear shoes. And, you know, they got thorns all over their feet. They can't come to Mangalarti anymore. Yeah. So, you know, when I think, what's the best austerity? And maybe one of the biggest austerities is actually... Calm down when you chant and just be with Krishna for two hours. Stop running away from Krishna when you chant. And so that's really a huge austerity. And I see initiation as part of the, the commitment. I will do the austerity of giving my attention to Krishna when I chant the holy name. That, that's, so these two things, I'm making a vow to follow principles and chant a certain number, but I'm also making a vow that I will give my attention to Krishna when I chant. I will chant properly. And then, if we do that, Prabhupada promises, this life you can see Krishna, you can dance with Krishna. So why miss that opportunity? Right? You know my joke, those of you who've been to my Japa workshops or retreats, you know my joke? It's like, I want to tell you why you're all here. Because in your last life, you were at a Japa retreat and you didn't pay attention. <laughs> So you had to come back in another life to another job or retreat. And so we don't want to see you in the next life. I mean, I may have to come back to teach more job or retreats. I don't know. But we don't want to see you in the next life. Yeah. So that's the idea. Thank you very much. So Shuji Sagar is going to begin uh, the ceremony now. And then you want to say something? Oh, oh yeah. A famous writer once wrote one of those six paragraph letters, and at the end he said, 
I'm sorry this is such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. This will be a short realization. <laughs> Yesterday, I was speaking with some friends about uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur section in the Sharanagati Anukula Yatmika, the favorable things for devotional service. And we were all sharing what is favorable for devotional service. And I realized that getting old is favorable for devotional service. It just kind of comes automatically. <laughs> um, if we take these vows and stick with them, as the years pass, our life is automatically fulfilled. We have accomplished something. We have done something wonderful that brings us joy internally every day as our bodies are winding down externally. So today is a uh, day for you to begin this process. And as you keep with your vows year after year, you'll see how much richer your life becomes. So may you be blessed to always keep these initiation vows. Hare Krishna. you want the microphone? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 Maybe this side. Um, okay, the obeisance is first. Yeah, yeah. So if you can make the space okay. for them to stay away from the problem. Ridhi has been a student here at Christian House for the better part of a year. He is a delightful young lady who is very patient, very stable, and steady in her moves and her. I am the winner for everybody. After the blessing, I'll accomplish the whole world. Anyone wonder how you touch me? You brought the whole thing. Oh. Your parents want to say anything? You want to say anything? I'm feeling uh, very blessed today that uh, Reggie is taking her uh, 
Um, just wanted to tell that um, right from very early in her age, um, I think around she was about six year old, she wanted to chant 16 rounds. She was trying, <laughs> she chanted many times 16 rounds. And uh, later, when she came to high school, she was in great association with devotees and she was very committed, rising early in the morning and doing Mangal Arati 4 30 a.m. every day for many years. And um, and I'm glad she met all of you in Krishna house and um, she's making that commitment for her entire life. So we are uh, very fortunate to have her in our family. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we're going to give her the microphone just to make sure you all hear. And um, you can all hold her accountable because you've heard it. Okay. So uh, go ahead. I have how to no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex, and no intoxication. And chant 16 rounds at least every day. What kind of rounds? Good round. Focus <laughs> round. Attentive round. How good? As best. Try. Try. You're try. Gonna try. Yeah. Okay. She thought her name was going to be Radhakund. I thought her name was going to be Radhakund, but it's not. <laughs> Because that's too obvious. <laughs> so your name is Radhika Preeti Devi Dasi. <laughs> so um, we had a Sanskrit scholar translate it, and this is what he said Servant of those who give love and joy to Radha but I can be the servant of the Manjaris, the gopis, any devotee, Hare Krishna. So here's your name with all the diacritics by the grace of Gopi Jivana. Radhika Priti Devi Dasi Ki Jai. So I guess Nandarani, you're next. Nandarani is a wonderful young devotee from Ukraine. He has been serving here at Krishna House for this semester and has won everyone's hearts by her gentle and st steady service and kind nature. Very happy to have you here. I have to write her name on my face. Radharani, do you speak English? A little bit. Your sister. Where's your sister? You want to speak something? Okay. Yeah, we can. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Thank you very much for having my sister here. And I feel that she is really happy. And I never saw her in such a good mood. So, our family. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I mean like you know when when you try to pretend that you're okay and when you're really uh, okay and happy so i believe it's uh, thanks to your association and the association of her spiritual master so thank you all of you thank you to mahatma prabhu uh, all our family uh uh, are like disciples of Mahatma Prabhu. So hopefully to continue this role as well, following my uh, sister, mm. Hare Krishna. Maybe, uh, maybe your mother can speak in the Yeah, sure. 
Хари Кришна, дорогой Гуру Махарадж, примите мои смиренные поклоны, вся слава Шили Пакупаде. Хари Кришна, dear Гуру Махарадж, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Шрила Прабхупада. Я даже не мечтала попасть в Америку, но какие обстоятельства сложились, что сейчас я нахожусь в таком прекрасном месте, в Кришна Хаусе, и вижу вас. <laughs> I uh, couldn't imagine that uh, I'll ever have, will come to America, but situation is that. So I'm here and I can see you, dear Guru Maharaj. Uh, all of our family are uh, took uh, like a shelter under your uh, lotus feet. Еще раз хочу поблагодарить вас за ваши знания, что вы ведете нас к Кришне, за вашу милость, которую вы проливаете на нашу семью. I want to say thank you uh, for knowledge.